Who would have thought that three fundamental forces for the Australian housing market would emerge at the same time, benefiting property investors and boosting housing prices in the long term? Number one, the consideration to cancel negative gearing and capital gain tax concessions has been completely scrapped. Two, almost every federal MP holds multiple properties. Three, money laundering. This is one of the main reasons for rising Australian housing prices that almost no one discusses. Yes, the kind of money laundering we're all familiar with. Even more astonishing is that the government knows the money is entering the Australian housing market but does nothing to supervise or stop it. Lawyers, accountants and real estate agents are all involved, causing housing prices to continue climbing. Combining these three factors further unveils the underlying logic behind the rise in the Australian real estate market. Hi, I'm Alex. Welcome to Oz Property Strategy, where I share information about real estate investment, economic trends, and wealth creation. If you like this video, smash the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell to watch new weekly videos. Without further ado, let's get into it. In previous episodes, I analyzed the federal government's plan to cancel negative gearing and capital gain tax exemptions. Such a cancellation would have been a major blow to property investors. At that time, my conclusion was that the federal government would not alter these two tax benefits. And now, my prediction has just come true. The federal treasurer has just given an official response. Previously, the treasurer had been carefully reviewing policies and simulating whether they could solve the housing market issues. The conclusion was that cancelling negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions cannot effectively increase housing supply. It would only have a minimal effect on the demand side, which is not the issue. So the current policies will remain unchanged. Earlier, the federal government wanted to pass the Help to Buy scheme. This means the government would contribute funds to help low- and middle-income people buy homes, with the government covering up to 40% of the house price, the buyer pays a minimum of 2%, and the rest through loans. Simply put, the government injects equity, not lending money to homeowners, but becoming a shareholder. The profit from selling the house must be shared proportionately with the government. The Labour Party wants to pass the Help to Buy scheme, which requires Senate approval, meaning they need the Greens' agreement. At this point, the Greens stepped it in and stabbed the Labour in the back, saying, if you want my support for help to buy, you must cancel negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions and freeze rent increases. Only then will I agree. The Senate's third reading of this bill has been postponed to November this year. Now the Treasurer has publicly stated that they will not consider cancelling negative gearing, effectively preparing for the Senate's third reading in November, anticipating the Greens' disagreement. It's estimated that these policies will be taken to the federal election in May next year. So property investors can rest easy. Negative gearing remains unchanged and capital gains tax concessions remain unchanged. Recently, this news went viral. In October, Australia's Prime Minister bought a luxury cliffside property with breathtaking views in Avoca Beach, Central Coast, of 4.3 million. Now, most people would think, well, he's the Prime Minister. Maybe he wants a place to settle down after retirement. What's wrong with that? Others might look deeper, questioning why the Prime Minister would buy an investment property while Australians face cost of living crisis, struggling to afford homes and rent. This could be politically damaging for him. These viewpoints are reasonable, but there's a detail few have noticed. The property purchase happened in October, but back in June, the Prime Minister signed off on a federal grant allocating $100 million to upgrade a road in the Central Coast, a road that just happens to lead straight to his new property. Coincidence? Perhaps not. Many can see something is not right here, even if they're not quite sure what. So why have Australian property prices risen consistently over the long term? One key reason is that Australia's federal government itself is dominated by property investors. According to the Federal Register of Interest, the 151 members of parliament collectively hold 377 properties. While 68% of Australians own property, 92% of MPs do. And within the opposition party, the Liberals, holding just 37% of seats with 57 members, collectively own 189 properties, which accounts for half of all properties held by all MPs. You might think the ruling Labour Party is there to serve the lower income Australians, offering benefits for those without homes and supporting renters. But that's not the case. Labour MPs are also heavily invested in real estate. Among ordinary Australians, only 4% own 4 or more properties, but among federal MPs, 15% hold 4 or more. And these two MPs each own 7 properties, accomplished property investors in their own right. In fact, of those holding the most properties, Labour MPs represent the majority. The average base salary for an Australian federal MP without any allowances is 217000 Cabinet members get an additional 157000 plus allowances. So what are they doing with all this income? They're buying property. 
You can probably see the root of the issue now. Australia's federal government is controlled by property investors, with property ownership as a majority trait across all parties. Even Green MPs hold quite a few investment properties, and Liberals on average own the most properties per person. As a property investor, you should know who to vote for in the next federal election. The fact that MPs hold so many properties gets in the way when they make any decisions. Nearly every policy decision is in favor of homeowners, especially property investors. To fundamentally resolve the issues in Australia's property market, the country would need to legislate a ban on all federal MPs owning investment properties, eliminating this conflict of interest. But let's be real, that will never happen. Why would those in power ever use their power to reduce their own interests? This explains why the government has introduced large numbers of immigrants in recent years, why every economic problem is met with a boost to the housing market, and why even the smallest rise in unemployment prompts housing market stimulus. It seems that in their eyes, rising property prices is the ultimate solution. If you still believe the Australian government will genuinely stand up for those without property, lowering home prices and protecting people's welfare, then you are sadly mistaken. They may talk about it. I doubt I'll see any change to this system before my retirement. And to those who are convinced not to buy property, who claim house prices will soon drop by 25%, what's your take? Here's my bet. If Australia's property prices dropped by just 5%, the federal government would be more panicked than you and be in a hurry to stimulate the market. As property investors, we just need to keep our eyes open and go with the trends. Why talk about Australia's property prices, money laundering and the government together when they seem unrelated? It's because the hidden connections among them run surprisingly deep. The government has turned a blind eye to money laundering in the Australian property market to boost housing prices and benefit its MPs. Australia's anti-money laundering enforcement body is called AUSTRAC. Its main job is to regulate all financial institutions and monitor and report suspicious transactions with the aim of anti-money laundering. Four years ago, Westpac faced a record-breaking fine of $1.3 billion from AUSTRAC for major failures in enforcing anti-money laundering laws. The CEO of Westpac even resigned. Since then, the new CEO has introduced various measures to fix these loopholes, showing how seriously the banking sector takes AML. So what does the bank monitor and what does it report or track? This regulatory process begins the moment you open an account. Banks have a process called KYC, Know Your Customer, where they check IDs and verify identities. Another step happens behind the scenes, matching the new client's profile against the bank's internal watch list. This list includes politicians, their families, prominent public figures, business moguls, executives, and anyone with negative media coverage in their home country. Banks now invest heavily in big data and AI technologies to collect this information with great accuracy, making it nearly impossible to hide one's identity, unless someone finds a regular person to act as a nominee account owner. If someone triggers a watch list alert, the bank won't stop them from opening an account or making transactions. However, it will record every single transaction, regardless of amount or frequency, and report it all to Austrack. After the KYC process comes the second step, ongoing monitoring. The first aspect is TTR, or Transaction Threshold Reporting. If any transaction exceeds $10,000, banks are required to record and report it. For example, if your account receives or sends over $10,000 in a single transaction, or you deposit or withdraw more than $10,000 at a bank counter or ATM, it will trigger the TTR mechanism. So if you don't want to get noticed, avoid that single transaction of $10,000. Some might ask, can I just deposit $9,999 daily to avoid TTR? While that avoids TTR, it triggers SMR, or suspicious matter reporting, which flags patent transactions. If you want to avoid SMR, your transactions must be completely irregular in both amount and frequency. Amounts flagged under TTR or SMR may undergo a case review where they are monitored individually by a bank staff. And if the activity seems more severe, it can escalate to a full audit which might lead to account freezes. But don't worry too much, freezing an account only means that the bank won't do business with you anymore. The money will still be returned to you. You can then open an account elsewhere. If you manage to avoid TTR and SMR, there's still the third level, CRS, Common Reporting Standard. For example, non-tax residents in Australia who have any financial transactions within Australian financial institutions trigger a reporting obligation. The institution must provide the data to the Australian Tax Office, ATO, which can then share it with other CRS participating countries. Over 100 countries have signed on to the CRS agreement, including the US, China, and Switzerland. So if China asks Swiss banks for information on Chinese nationals with accounts in Switzerland, Swiss banks are required to comply. 
Similarly, China theoretically has access to the transaction information of Chinese citizens in Australia. So if you open a bank account in Australia, you're guaranteed to be monitored. If your transaction triggers a specific mechanism, they escalate in severity from a yellow alert to a red alert. Of course, this only matters when the funds in the banking system are illegitimate. So how do you reduce banking involvement while laundering money? Australia has got you covered. Remember hearing about Chinese buyers using cash to buy Australian properties a few years ago? Cash is untraceable. So when it's used to buy property and hand it directly to developers, it simply counts as regular income for them. Nothing suspicious there. Since the buyer used the cash, there's no banking record. So banks won't bother tracking the buyer's source of funds. After a few years, the property's value appreciates, the buyer sells it, and then deposits the money into the bank. When the bank asks, where did all this money come from? The answer, I made a profit selling my property. It's perfectly reasonable, and the bank's due diligence is fulfilled. The bank doesn't have to investigate where the money used to buy the property originally came from because it isn't legally required to. Some might ask, but in Australia, property transactions involve lawyers, accountants, and real estate agents. If they see a buyer using large sums of cash or unclear sources of funds, wouldn't they report it to Austrac? No, they wouldn't. Austrac doesn't require lawyers, accountants, or real estate agents to report suspicious transactions. Why? Because there's no law in Australia mandating this. In September, Parliament proposed legislation to make these three professions comply with existing anti-money laundering standards. The bill has passed in the House of Representatives and went through a second reading in the Senate on October the 10th, but it's still a long way from third reading and final passage. If this bill passes Australia's most legitimate and lawful means of money laundering, buying property could be shut down. But will it pass? I think the chances are slim to none, close to zero. Here are some reasons. First, people laundering money through real estate aren't concerned about property prices. They will drive prices up without hesitation, paying any premium. If the bill passes, a significant factor in driving up Australia property prices will disappear. With less foreign money flowing in, property prices won't rise as fast, which would be a big blow to federal MPs and senators. Second, Australia actually passed anti-money laundering laws back in 2006. Shortly afterwards, a loophole was found real estate agents, accountants, and lawyers weren't included. At the time, the government promised to introduce an amendment quickly, but that quick fix took nearly 20 years. Why hasn't anyone brought it up since? Because doing so would harm the interests of nearly all federal MPs and the powerful forces behind them. With a the federal government full of property investors, various lobbying groups, and glaring legal loopholes, I highly doubt Australia's beloved houses will face long-term declines. Remember this key property investment principles from Oz Property Strategy. The Australian housing market experiences short-term fluctuations, but it rises in the long run. One of the reasons I founded Oz Property Strategy was because I saw the flaws in Australia's system. Ordinary people struggle to find housing, but government officials have piles of investment properties, often purchased with taxpayer's money. So why shouldn't regular people also own multiple investment properties and become wealthy? Oz Property Strategy is here to help people start with their first investment property and gradually build a portfolio, achieving financial freedom through property investment. You don't need to be wealthy. With some saving and borrowing capacity, you can join our Vision membership, start your property investment journey, earn passive income, and retire early. If you made it this far, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe, and share this with your friends. Turn on the notification bell to watch new weekly videos. And have a good one. Bye.